uh, director of the Kluge Center, and we're glad to uh, have you here at the Kluge Members Room here in the Jefferson Building. Uh, some of you may not know too much about the Kluge Center, but the Kluge Center uh, was, uh, was founded in 2000, and its mission is to bridge the gap between scholarship on the one hand and Congress, other policymakers, and the interested public on the other. Uh, to contribute to the debate about the challenges facing democracies in the 21st century. We do that in a variety of ways, including events like this. Uh, and uh, let me uh, just outline what we're going to do today. There will be a book signing afterward, and I hope you'll stay around for the reception as well. And uh, basically, I'm going to pitch some questions to John, and we'll see what he has to say for 40 minutes or so, and then we'll turn to your questions. Okay. Oh, before you ask the first question, yeah. may I just make a general uh, statement? Um, so, hello everyone, I'm, I'm John Haidt, I'm a, a professor at NYU Stern, uh, and we'll be talking about, uh, in part about my book, The Problem of the American Mind. Uh, but a lot of my researchers will be talking about some things that could offend you or drive you crazy if you're in that normal reactive mode. But I hope this beautiful setting, this library, will just put us all in the mode of like, we've got problems, let's think about them, let's talk about them. That's what we're going to do. And you know, he, uh, John mentioned that he, that he got his uh, bachelor's degree. It was in philosophy at Yale. His PhD is in psychology at, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And he went on to teach for 16 years at UVA before he ended up at the Stern School of Business and, and as a, the chair for ethical leadership at NYU. Um, I want to particularly emphasize uh, uh, an earlier book he wrote, because we're going to build a question on that. The first question I have is built on that. Uh, his, it's, it's, I, I think I would say his most ac acclaimed book. Um, that still remains to be seen. We'll see what happens with the, with the new book, The Coddling of the American Mind. But it was a New York Times bestseller. It's called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. I think if you want to understand our political divisions, in my opinion, it's the single book you should read. Uh, in that book, he offers an account of the origins of the human moral sense, and he shows how variations in moral intuitions can help explain the polarization and what some might call dysfunction of our politics. So a good place to start, particularly here in Washington, for, for this particular audience is with that book. Can you tell us about mm -hmm. your research related to that book and how you got from the righteous mind mm -hmm. to the coddled, coddled mind? mind. Right. In, the, in the new book, it's the coddling of the American mind. Right. Um, so I, I study morality. That's what I've done since graduate school. And I look at it both from an evolutionary perspective and a cultural, psychological, or anthropological perspective at the same time. And I was looking at how, how cultures vary around the world and why there are a lot of similarities and differences. And in the 1990s, I began to notice that the American culture war was heating up to such an extent that left and right were like different countries, like different cultures. We have different American history. If you ask what's American history on the left and the right, it's like different countries. If you ask what's the US Constitution, two different constitutions. If you ask about climate science, if you ask about so many things, we're, com we're coming apart. And that was in the 90s. Um, so I began um, studying that, and originally I was on the left. I was always on the left when I was younger. And I began uh, uh, really studying political psychology in order to help the Democrats win, because after 2000 and 2004, I thought, they have no clue how to talk about morality. Um, I'd like to help them uh, connect with American morality. So I set out to understand conservatives and read conservative writings and watch conservative TV shows. And what I discovered was that on any complicated issue you want to think about, if you're not if you're only looking at it from one perspective, you can't possibly understand it. And I found it was so much fun and so interesting to look at things from a conservative perspective and later libertarian perspective. And so eventually, I just sort of stepped out and I said, okay, I'm not on any team anymore. And I think to be a social scientist, it's very helpful to not be on a team. It's really corrupting to be on a team and to want certain results to come, come out of your research. Um, so I was working on the problem of political polarization for a long time. I wrote the book, The Righteous Mind. It came out in 2012, and then things kept getting worse and worse. But the basic perspective that we are tribal creatures, we evolved for tribal conflict, we're very good at doing us versus them, uh, and this is the nature, this allows us to do sports, this allows us to do politics. It's all the same psychology. So while I'm working on this problem, suddenly these strange things start happening in my backyard, namely universities. Beginning in 2014, we started seeing students asking for trigger warnings, protesting speakers on the grounds that if this speaker comes to campus, it will be traumatizing or damaging to some students. You know, you might say, well, why don't you just not go to the talk? But no, they would say, no, no, it, it, we can't have this person step foot on our campus. So it was a new morality, a new fearfulness about words and ideas. 
so uh, Greg Lukianoff and I wrote this book. Greg Lukianoff came to me. He's the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. He came to me with this idea that somehow students were learning to interpret words and books and ideas using the exact same cognitive distortions that he had learned not to do when he learned cognitive behavioral therapy. He had a suicidal depression in 2007. He thinks cognitive therapy saved his life. You learn all these distortions, black and white thinking, catastrophizing, mind reading, labeling, all these things that people sometimes do, but depressed and anxious people do constantly. And so the therapy is you, stop do, you learn how to stop doing that. And Greg noticed students are beginning to really do that a lot, catastrophizing, everything's good or evil. Um, around 2014, we write an article in The Atlantic, it comes out in 2015, and we think we're done. We did our analysis of what the AD trend. And then at Halloween of 2015, some of you know, some of you don't, but at Halloween of 2015 at Yale, and then it went everywhere, it went in many other places, there were giant protests. It was like a new moral culture had emerged on some campuses. And it's a real puzzle, and it's a very difficult one to work with, um, as well, I guess we'll get to, but it's, it's, a, it's a call out culture. It makes it very difficult for people to work together. So that's how we got from my work on originally cultural differences to political differences and the culture war to what's going on on campus. And I think during our discussion, we'll come then off of campus back to politics. Yeah, we'll get, ideas. but sticking with campus is, is uh, uh, go into more detail about what you identified as the issues on campus and um, in particular, uh, you know, maybe a couple of specific examples. I mean, some of them have gotten a lot of press nationally. That, you know, when I was reading your book, uh, I, I noticed that you also brought in examples that I hadn't heard of before mm -hmm. that were that were illuminating. Yeah. So I'll, I'll sure. To... So let me first check. Um, how many of you, if, if I just ask you about the the protests at Berkeley when Miley Yiannopoulos was was death, was scheduled to speak? Raise your hand if you know what that is. If you've heard about that. Okay, most but not all of you. The great majority of you. Um, or the protests at Yale when Nicholas Christakis was surrounded by students who demanded that he apologize. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Okay, there, there's less than half. All right, so there are these, the most spectacular events are mobbing where students circle around a, a professor or a speaker and they demand that he be fired or he retract something. Uh, speaker shoutdowns where typically a conservative speaker is invited to campus and the students demand that he be disinvited. And if the uh, president of the university won't disinvite them, then they protest, they try to block people from coming in or they go in and they try to shout him down. So these things happened, there were some of these in the 60s, um, uh, but they didn't happen for a long time. And then there's a lot, a lot of them now. By a lot, I mean a few dozen. It's not happening at every school, but there are dozens of these. These are always videotaped. Everybody pulls out their cell phone, and so they're on the internet, and especially right-wing media sites love them because they really show students being intolerant of conservative uh, ideas and speakers. Um, those are the most spectacular things, but those are fairly rare. What I'd rather talk about with you, or what you may not know about, is the really subtle ways that the speech climate on campus has changed. And this is very widespread and very damaging. So I'll just share with you a couple of examples, because <clears throat> now people, you know, people write to me all the time now with these examples. Um, uh, and so, one, so I, I co-run a group called Heterodox Academy, and the woman who now runs it um, was a professor at Harvey Mudd College, at one of the Claremont colleges in California. And she uses the example of how um, a student came to talk to her, well, a, a student came to talk to her, and um, and he, st he started to say, uh, you know, yeah, that's a great idea because that would kill two birds with, and he covered his mouth. And she said, what, were you gonna say two birds with one stone? And he said, well, yes, but that would be violent. And he was afraid, because if you say, like he could be called out, like he could be shamed for saying that. Here's another story from another college in California. Three students, this was emailed to me by a friend. Um, her daughter and two other people were walking, two other students were walking on campus, and her daughter said, wow, I'm starving. And her friends called her out on that. That's insensitive, because there are people who are really starving. Um, uh, so those are just two examples from college, but this sort of thing is happening all the time. That is, students get prestige by showing that they are more sensitive to various victim groups and marginalized groups. They get prestige by calling out someone for insensitivity. Now, most students are perfectly normal and sane or not doing this, but in any group, there are some who are. And so if you can imagine what it's like to be a student where you never know when you're gonna be publicly shamed, and of course, someone could not tell you that you're being shamed. They just go and they, they put it on social media, and now your reputation is destroyed. Um, uh, this sort of thing happens at universities all the time. It, now it's creeping out into the workplace. So this is not just on campus. So here are a couple. So 
a, a woman who runs an organization on business ethics that I, that I co-founded, she said a friend of hers was just reported to HR. Why? Because she was on a conference call, and after the conference call, the person they were talking to had been speaking so quickly, she said, wow, that guy sounded like he was on Ritalin. And a few days later, she's called into HR because that was insensitive. It's insensitive to people who have ADHD. Now again, you can, you can discuss whether we should talk about this, but this is the pattern. Is you, you, you report someone, you don't, you don't tend to resolve it directly, you report someone. And so here's a review of my book on Amazon. Quote, I couldn't understand why my new bright young workers kept running to HR for every little interpersonal problem and why they refused to show up to meetings with the person who they thought offended them. Because it's very threatening. If someone tells a joke and you're offended and you report them to HR for having told a joke to someone else, not even to you, just you overheard it, you're offended. It would be very frightening and traumatizing even to have to be in a room with that person. So you just want to report it to HR, have them punish the person and leave you out of it. Now imagine what it would be like to work with people like this. Again, most students, most students are fine, but some are, have adopted this new morality. Let me make clear, this is not the millennials. Millennials are okay. This is the generation after millennials. You see this in students born in 1995 and after. So that's the phenomenon we're talking about. You know, and, and I want to hit you with a question, because you mentioned something a couple of minutes ago about how you saw this happening. This, this is all over the book where, hey, there's this dividing line. I mean, you know, it's not yeah. a bright line. It's but pretty it's, bright. It, okay, then it is a bright line. It is a bright line. <laughs> it's amazing. In 2014. Yeah. I'm going to hit you with, with a series of questions about that. And uh, okay. you can come back at me if you don't remember them all. You know, maybe you'll have some mnemonic device. That, okay. But uh, so why, what's this dividing line about in 2014? Yeah. Why is it 2014? Uh, was it something in 2014 or the roots further back? Is it worse at some types of mm -hmm. colleges and universities than others? And I noted that, that you went into great detail in the book and what might be as, as fascinating a part of it as anything uh, about how it's worse for women, yeah. girls and then women, than it is for boys yeah. and then men, which is quite interesting. Yeah. So maybe you can go mm -hmm. into some of those. Sure. So here's the, uh, so there are only two places in history, uh, in modern history, where there's a clear dividing line. So 1946 is one. If you were born in 1946, your childhood was different than if you were born in 1943 because it was a, you know, everything changed after the war. Um, and strangely, if you were born in 1995 or afterwards, your child is different than if you were born in 1992 or before. And so, um, and the, the clearest evidence of that is in the, contained in the book iGen by Jean Twenge. She goes through all kinds of uh, nationally representative studies about behavior of adolescents. And what you find is that beginning with kids born around 1994, five, um, they go out a lot less. They don't, they're much less likely to drink alcohol, much less likely to go out on dates, much less likely to have ever worked for money. They are much more anxious, much more depressed. Um, their lives change, their childhood change. Now why? So they were hit with a number of things that are different from the millennials. The most important of which is Facebook opens up in 2006 to the world, so you can be a 13-year-old or an 11-year-old who lies. So you can be a 13-year-old in 2006 and get Facebook. But very few do. In 2007, um, when these kids are 11 or 12, um, the iPhone comes out. And now you can have Facebook and social media with you all the time. But very few do. It's quite expensive. But gradually, by about 2009, a lot of them do. So there's huge adoption of social media around 2009, 2010 by adolescents in the United States. And right at 2011, 2012, the anxiety and depression rates start going steadily upwards, especially for girls. So social media is thought to be the main culprit for why things got so bad after 2011, 2012. If, you, if you're a millennial and you got Facebook in college, your brain was already mostly formed. But if you're 13 when you get Facebook, Instagram, all those things, the, the nature of social relationships is so different and so, so much social comparison and fear of shame that your sociality is different. So social media is thought to be the main thing. But the other big thing is the change in whether you got to be independent between ages 8 and 12. This is turning, I'm just discovering this now. As I, and let me do the survey with you. So, um, so most of you here, the great majority of you are over 40. What I want to ask you is, how old were you 
when you were allowed outside on your own, meaning you could walk to a friend's house three blocks away, you could go down to the corner store and buy a candy bar or go get some milk to bring home for your parent, you know, for the family. How old were you? Was it first grade, second grade, third grade, sixth grade? You know, how, how old were you when you were allowed out? First grade is usually about eight, you know, six. So uh, fifth grade is like around age 10. Think, think of your number, and then I'm just going to have you call it out. OK, those of you over 40, just call out the numbers. What age? Seven. OK, this is what I always find. It's, it's six, seven, or eight. This is what it always was. And this is what it is around the world. I've studied street kids all over the world. Street kids start age seven or eight. A five-year-old cannot live out on the street. A bunch of eight-year-olds can run from the cops, steal food, and sleep under a bridge. Okay? And most of you did something like that. Like, not that bad, but you, know, you had adventures. Okay? Now, is there anybody here under 25? I don't think so. Anybody under 25? Raise your hand. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, where, uh, what age were you allowed out? Okay. But, okay. What I find when I speak at colleges, it's 12, 13, 14, sometimes 15, 16. Um, last week, I spoke at Case Western, and one woman said six. And I said, really? Where'd you grow up? And she said, well, the Philippines. But when we, then we moved here when I was nine, and then I wasn't allowed out until I was 14. So we've done this giant experiment where there's this period between 8 to 12, which is the great period of cultural exploration. This is the period that children's stories are about. How many children's stories do you know that are about an eight or nine-year-old kid uh, you know, or, or siblings who go off on an adventure with their parents? Like, I guess it happens. There's like the Swiss Family Robinson or something. But it's almost always they leave the parents, and they go off and have adventures. They learn how to be independent. And what we've done, and we did this in the 90s. This is why. This is why you get the life right line. Everybody up until the 90s, including the millennials, got the chance to practice independence before it was too late, before the window closed. From 8 to 14 is a critical, uh, 13, critical period for cultural learning and accent learning. If you're exposed to a foreign language first at age 14, it's too late. You will never speak it like a native. So what we've done is we've systematically taken this critical period for cultural learning, independence learning, and we said, no independence for you until it's too late. We'll wait till the window closes. We'll wait till the learning period's over. And then we'll say, now you can go out. And guess what? They don't go out. They don't go out. They sit on their bed with their devices, and they communicate. So they're still social, but it's in the safety of their room. So you had a concept in there that, that was new to me, anti-fragility. Yes. And that, that ties to this, right? Yeah. That, so this is such a powerful concept. Raise your hand if you know what that is, anti-fragility. Do you know what that is? Very few. One so, guy back there. So it's a, it's a term coined by uh, Nassim Taleb, the guy who wrote The Black Swan. It, it's a brilliant concept. It's a clunky word, but he made it up because there is no word in the English language, and we need it. So if you think about it, like a wine glass is fragile, and nothing good happens if you drop a wine glass on the ground. It's fragile. And so we give our kids plastic cups. We, toddlers get plastic cups because those are resilient. They don't break, but they don't get better. There's nothing good. It's like a, a glass doesn't get better if you drop it on the ground. And what Taleb wanted was a concept for things that get better when you drop them on the ground. So he was studying the banking system. And he, he predicted in 2006, he said, this banking system is such a mess, and it's never been tested. It's never been tested. If anything goes wrong, it's going down. And he was right. And so he's trying to describe, well, what we need is something more like the immune system. The immune system is anti-fragile. If you keep your kids safe from bacteria, what are you doing to them? You're, just, you're, just, you're depriving their immune system of the chance to learn. The immune system is anti-fragile. The reason why peanut allergies are going up in this country is because we've been protecting kids from peanuts. We don't give them a chance to learn that peanuts are not harmful. Their immune system doesn't learn. So this is our point in the book. Children are anti-fragile. They, they have to face teasing, insults, exclusion. They have to go out and get lost and get scared and ask someone for directions home. My kids refuse to ask someone for directions. They're, it's terrifying for them because you know, they, they haven't had to do it. We're trying to push them out. Anyway, my point is you need a lot of negative experiences in order to become an independently functioning person. And in the name of protecting them, we have denied them the negative experiences that they need. We don't let them have those until they're 15 or 16. And John, that's a great segue to the, to the next question I had, which is that uh, you and Greg have, have a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of very specific remedies in the book. Um, both in the realm of parenting, the, uh, the ones I listed just quickly after reading the book were disconnecting from iPhones, much more free play, de-emphasizing certain types of safety, which yeah. is what you were just referring to, as well as at universities, 
um, promoting viewpoint diversity among faculty mm -hmm. and other things. So let's plumb a little yeah. deeper. I mean, but the way you, I will, wait, wait, I have a suggestion. Yeah. Let's first let me lay out the six causal threads because if yeah. we, let's let's lay out like okay. the multiple causes and then we'll talk about how to reverse some of those. Uh -huh. right, so, um, <clears throat> so I'm a social scientist and that means that um, I study social problems and I just t you know we tend to everything. There's, there's never one factor causation. Almost anything interesting, there's going to be all these different intersecting, interacting factors. And so we had this very sudden emergence of this new morality on campus in 2014, 2015. It seemed to come out of nowhere. And Greg and I, in the book, we trace it out. We say, actually, there's six intersecting threads. It's like six fuses all came together. And when they met around 2014, 2015, things blew up. So I'll just briefly run through them. Uh, number one is the political purification of the universities at a time of increasing political polarization. So professors have always leaned left, but between 1995, when it was just about two or three to one left-right uh, uh, ratio on the faculty, to 2010, by then it's about five or six to one left-right. And the core areas, English, history, philosophy, it's more like 20 or 30 to one left-right. So we have universities shifting much further left at a time when the culture war is heating up, so left and right really, really hate each other more. So if universities are now more clearly on one side of the culture war, their internal dynamics are going to be much more about fighting the culture war. So we're not free to just explore ideas. If a conservative speaker comes to campus, it's not like, oh, what does he have to say? I'm sure he's a schmuck. It's, what? We can't give him a platform. So the, so the rising polarization and political purification is one of the big factors why universities have kind of gone crazy. So not most, but the, the shoutdowns are almost all in the northeast and the coastal strip of the west coast. That's where the violence and the intimidation is taking place on campus. So the culture war is a big part of it. Uh, number two, the rising rates of mental illness. And again, this is, I mentioned this a moment ago, the statistics are stunning. The, the, by self-report, anxiety is going up by a factor of two or three um, in adolescence. It's not just self-report. It's not just that they say they're depressed. Hospital admissions for self-harm, for taking, po drinking poison or cutting yourself with a sharp object, those show the exact same pattern, way up for girls. Not so much up for boys, but way up for gir teenage girls. Um, suicide uh, is up 25% for boys from the first decade of this century to the last couple years, 25% increase in the suicide rate for boys, which is huge. For girls, it's 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent increase in suicide for teenage American girls. Same thing is happening in the UK. Um, um, so we have a real crisis on campus. This is even before they get to campus. But now we have all these people with depression and anxiety coming to campus, and some of them say they want trigger warnings, they want safe spaces, they want protection. And what university can say, no, tough it out. You can't say that. Because then if, if she commits suicide, of course, you're, you're exposed to liability. I mean, there's other reasons. And compassion, of course, is a major reason. But the administrators, and this is another thread, the administrators become increasingly focused on liability, not on education. So they get defensive. And so we get all these things coming together to change the speech culture and the administration on campus so that it's not about healthy debate. It's not about vigorous argument. It's not about fearless inquiry. It's about safety and danger. And what we're talking about with safety and danger is ideas, books, words. So my kids get this in third grade. It's all about safety and danger. Not physical, emotional. And this is a terrible thing to teach kids. That negative emotions mean you're in danger. And you therefore you need protection. So there's all these things coming together so that kids born after 1995 haven't been given the chance to practice maturity and independence. We've been overprotecting them. And that's why the title of the book is The Coddling of the American Mind. Coddling means overprotection. And the subtitle is How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. So anyway, all those threads, they're hard to reverse. OK. So, so yeah. you know, my, my thinking when I read the book and I read of the remedies, which are all these, it's what makes sense when you, you know, get people away from their iPhones, Universities need to have a more diversity of viewpoints in the faculty, let's say. But those are running into uh, what I describe as uh, category six headwinds. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's going against the zeitgeist or whatever, however you want to describe it. So, yeah. so what, are you, what are you trying to do about that? Yeah. So it's true that if, if you look at the six trends that we lay out, um, none of them are easily reversible, especially the polarization. That, I think, is just going to get worse and worse in this country. 
Um, but I'm actually optimistic that we can, if you break this up, let's break the problem down. We have to change what we're doing to kids. Um, we have to change the way we're teaching kids, especially in high school, before they get to college. And then we have to change what we're doing in universities. I'm really optimistic that we can change childhood for this reason. Um, parents want what's, well, parents want what's best for their kids, but that's not entirely true. Parents really, really want their kids to be successful, and especially to get into a top college. And if that means their kids have to be unhappier, they're going to do it. Um, but now that it's becoming clear that if you want to prepare your kid for success and to get into a good college, don't make them study. Don't, don't overschedule and make them study from the age of four through, through 16. That's setting them up for weakness and frailty. Um, now that it's clear, there's no evidence that starting academic training at age four, five, or six does any good. In Scandinavia, in Germany, they don't start till age seven. Before then, it's all about play. That's what kids are supposed to do is play. So it's now that it's clear that there's a mental health catastrophe, especially for girls, now that it's clear that early academic training at ages four, five, six don't help at all, now that it's finally clear that play is actually what the kids need to do, now, now we're, we're in a situation where lots of parents want to do that, but they don't know how to start. So when I read all, about all this a few years ago, the wonderful book Free Range Kids by Lenore Skenazy, and I tried to get my, my seven or eight-year-old son to go outside and go to the store, he'd say, but, but people look at me funny. There, there are no other kids out there. And he's afraid of getting busted. I gave him a little license that said, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of arresting me, please go read Huck Finn, uh, and then you know, and then call my father. You know, I have permission to be outside. Um, uh, but he was shy about it. So it's a social coordination problem. Um, so, but na but but um, there are ways to solve the problem. So Utah is the first, the only state in the country that passed a free-range parenting law. They specifically said last March they endured, they finally passed it. You cannot be arrested for letting your kids outside to play. And that clear statement means a lot more parents are willing to say, OK, kids, go to the park. Um, so, um, it, so if every state, whatever state you, you're in, call your, your state reps, ask them to introduce a free-range parenting bill. That's the first step. Second, if you have kids or grandkids, there are ways to coordinate so that all the kids in the neighborhood know you meet at this playground. You meet in, the, in this person's backyard. Kids have to have a lot more unsupervised time. Unsupervised doesn't mean nobody knows where they are. It means no adult is watching. No adult is going to step in to resolve conflict. If someone gets badly hurt, they know, OK, we go to Mrs. Smith's house. She's right there. But kids have to have a lot more time to work out conflicts. That's preparation for democracy. When kids play in groups, they learn how to work things out, how to keep the game going by being responsive to other people's needs. They learn compromise. They learn how to enforce rules and make rules that are fair. So I'm actually really optimistic. There's so much unhappiness with par among parents about the lack of play, the overscheduling, the constantly being on devices. Um, but, the, you know, but if you just tell your kid you can't be on a device, what are they going to do? No, there's no other kids outside. So if we, we have to solve all the problems together. So I'm optimistic we're going to make progress on that. Um, in high schools. And why is it worse for girls? Why is the mental yeah. health situation worse for so girls? We, we don't know, but the leading thought is this. So again, this is from Jean Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E, who wrote this book, iGen. Um, so think about it this way. Um, all kids love devices. Most of us, when we were kids, we couldn't take our eyes off the TV screen. Our parents said it would rot our brains. It turns out TV isn't that bad for you, but not playing outside is, is bad for you. So it, you know, the TV itself wasn't so bad. Um, social media is really different. If you give, if you suddenly let all kids, you know, by age eight, nine, ten, have a device, what happens? What do the boys do? Just call it out. Those of you who have sons, what do your boys do with devices? Video games. That's right. They play video games all day long. Turns out, video games aren't really bad for you. They take you away from outdoor play, but but they're so they're often social. My my son is playing. You know, he, they're like they're like, you know, they're a team trying to kill other teams. That's actually pretty good for you. Um, what do girls do? Girls are um, taking selfies that take a long, long time to compose. They have filters to make themselves look more beautiful. So we're all aware that models are not real, that girls are exposed to models and magazines that aren't real. We've talked about this for 20 or 30 years, that girls have unreasonable beauty standards. Now suddenly, their friends, the women or the girls around them, are distorted to look more beautiful. To the point
point where now girls and young women are asking for, for plastic surgery so that they can look more like their Instagram photos. Um, so girls are doing a lot more social comparison. Girls feel much more inadequate. And especially, girls' sociality is based on who's in, who knows whose secrets, who's being excluded. Girls are much more about that. Boys are more about dominance in sports, hierarchy, and ability. They're more vertical. Girls are more horizontal. And Facebook, Instagram, these things are incredibly powerful ways to let girls know that they were not included in this fun, fun event, which is distorted to look really super fun, to the point where some college girls say, I can't make it to that party. Can you take my phone, take some photos, and I'll post it to make it look like I was there? I mean, this is crazy stuff. But you can imagine how teenage girls, it really does a number on them. If you, so if you first get this stuff when you're 18 or 19, it's not so bad. But if you first got it when you were 13, in other words, if you're born in 1995 or after, and you get this stuff when you're 13, it's really bad for girls. So switching gears a little bit, uh, well, let, let's stick with that, actually, for a second. What about the headwinds at universities? You know, because yeah. you know, the colleges, some folks probably in this room went to some of the more elite places. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're more liberal. I mean, they're, they're, tenure has the effect of, uh, well, I'm going to hire people who think like I do. Right. That, that's supposed to be academic freedom or yeah, something, right? right, that's right. Um, so that uh, there isn't the diversity, and then you have this group mentality, the Durkheimian thing that you, yeah. that you raised. So how do you combat that? Yeah. So at universities, we have to make a lot of changes. Um, one reason I'm optimistic is that anybody who is a university president or dean or administrator, it's always been a difficult job. But in the last two or three years, they all say their job has become impossible. Because if there's any conflict between any two students, one person tells a joke, one person makes a reference, one person wears a piece of clothing they bought on vacation, that's cultural appropriation. That's insensitive. That's offensive. Um, and these things can blow up to the point where they can get into the newspaper. They never know when there will be a, a group protesting, demanding that they intervene, demanding that they punish someone. It's an impossible situation. So university presidents are finally ready to exert some leadership if they, if they know what to do. The first two years were marked by an almost complete absence of leadership. One reason is because the complaints often come from either the, the, the black students group, the women students group, the LGBT group, and nobody wants to stand up against them and appear insensitive. We're very progressive. We're very focused on diversity and inclusion. To the extent that a lot of these protests are linked in some way to an identity issue, nobody can stand up against that. One reason I'm optimistic is that in the last year, so many people, so many great people are writing. These are people who are not straight white males are writing to say, the way we're doing identity politics is really bad for everybody, including my group. So you know, black scholars are not uniform. There's a lot of diversity among them. And we're beginning to see some, like John McWhorter. Um, um, there are a whole bunch that are now saying, wait, this kind of identity politics is really bad for black students. Um, Amy Chua, Chinese American schol uh, scholar at Yale Law School, and, um, uh, has this great book on political tribes. Um, Francis Fukuyama just came out with a book called uh, On Identity. So a lot of scholars who are not straight white males are saying, this is nuts to say, let's all band together, us versus the straight white males, because they are the source of the problem. And let, you know, the, the us versus them thinking that is now rising in prominence on campus, this is a dead end street. This is never going to lead to a welcoming environment where people feel welcome. It's going to lead to constant conflict. In, and here we can come back to the country at large now. A multi-ethnic secular democracy is, is like a contraption that should never fly. Political organization for our species is almost always based on ties of blood or soil. Um, you get religions like Islam that transcend it with God. So either blood, soil, or God. Those are your options. America was an experiment. We talk about the American experiment. It was an experiment. It probably shouldn't have worked. But, and it almost didn't work. But if you get everything lined up right, it can work. Clearly, a secular liberal in the you know, philosophical sense, a secular liberal democracy can work. And they've worked all over Europe until recently. Now they're not working. What's going on? Issues of immigration, identity, division, these blow things apart. America was brilliant in the 20th century at forming an overarching identity, saying, we don't care what your blood is. We don't care where you came from. If you believe in the American ideals, you're in. America had a way of, 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 of creating a superordinate identity that was the envy of, of the world. And now many of us think 
we're going down roads of certain forms of identity politics that, that reverse that and that turn our diversity into a weakness. Diversity is not automatically a strength. It can be, it can also be a weakness. And I think we're mismanaging it in universities, we're mismanaging it in a lot of European countries, and the results could be really devastating. So before we go to the, the questions from the, from the audience, I have, I have a, a hard question for you and then a really easy one. Okay. Um, the easy one you can do real quickly, but the hard one maybe you might need some more time. So uh, the Attorney General, Jeff oh, Sessions, yeah. and uh, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, they talk a lot about viewpoint yeah. diversity. Yeah. Uh, DeVos even cited one of your lectures in a speech uh, quite recently. Is this helpful to you? Um, That's and, the easy question, no. <laughs> no. That was the hard question. Oh, <laughs> Uh, okay, let me elaborate on that. So, um, so I founded, I co-founded a group called Heterodox Academy. Uh, is anybody here a professor in any way? Or are you listed on the web page of any? Uh, okay, all of you professors, if you're listed on the web page of any university, I urge you to go to heterodoxacademy.org. Um, we we founded it in 2015. It's a bunch. It's now 2,300 professors who believe that viewpoint diversity is a good thing. That we have to seek out and welcome political diversity in particular. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we are the only politically diverse organization in the academy that I know of. We're about 20% professors on the left, 20% on the right, and we're mostly all the people who don't fit in. So it's libertarians, centrists, and people who are just really heterodox. Um, uh, so uh, we've been advocating for more viewpoint diversity since 2015. Donald Trump, in his very first, uh, when he had that first debate, you know, he sort of introduced it to the country. The very first thing he says is, there's too much political correctness in the country. Now, we don't talk a lot about political correctness, but we are kind of pushing back against it. It's like, oh, no, I don't want him on my side. Um, and, and Betsy DeVos is on my side, and Jeff Sessions is on my side. And the only point I'm making here is that universities are, are left-leaning progressive institutions that if you push them from outside, and especially Congress has a history of managing things terribly. I mean, if Congress is going to legislate how you do something, it's going to be a disaster. So I don't want the federal government saying, universities need to, you know, we're going to punish those that don't have 50% conservatives. I mean, this is not helpful. This is not a good idea. So I think that we can solve it. I think there, we now have the will. We now have a much better understanding. I think we can solve this problem ourselves. And if in a time of a culture war, if viewpoint diversity and openness to, to and free inquiry, if these become things that the conservatives want, then ipso facto, they're going to be things that the progressives don't want. Just as Obamacare was a conservative idea, but once Obama took it on, now conservatives were against it. That's the nature of a polarization cycle and a culture war. So I'd really rather they just stay out of it. Yeah, but uh, it, it actually illustrates uh, one of the things you talk about in maybe all of your books, but certainly the two I've read, is that just because somebody's on the other team doesn't mean they're always wrong. And that's one of the, you know, the things you, you stress that, that, that that's one of the, you know, it's a cognitive, it's a CBT thing. You know, it's like, you know, they're not necessarily wrong all the time. You may disagree with Betsy DeVos 93% of the time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't stumble upon the truth every mm -hmm. now and then, so you want that's to take right. it seriously, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. So, so politics is one kind of game, and it's analogous more to war at times. Well, it's, you know, politics is supposed to be a positive sum game, but current American policy is more like war. Um, university life is nothing like that. University life, we need, we need our opponents. We need to be challenged because we're all so subject to the confirmation bias. We're all so, but scientists are not just really smart people and they don't make discoveries because they're so smart. Scientists are productive because they have an institution in which they're put together so that whatever they say will be challenged by others. And it's that challenge process that knocks down the bad ideas, that strips us of our wishful thinking. Politics isn't like that. Politics, well, at its best, can do that. That's what a deliberative body is supposed to be. But they don't do that in the Senate chambers anymore. So the, the, the quick sum up, I thought, might be useful for people is that uh, you opened the book talking about the three great untruths. And you've touched on all three of them, mm -hmm. but, it, but it might be a good to sort of list the three. Yeah. And sure. Explain. So yeah, so the subtitle of the book is how bad ideas, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. Here are the three bad ideas that the book is about. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. All three of these are really bad ideas. 
All three of these are the exact opposite of ancient wisdom. My first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, had 10 chapters devoted to 10 psychological ideas that you find all over the world. Those three that I just said are the exact opposites of three of the chapters in my first book. If we can teach our kids to believe all three, we can almost guarantee that they will fail in life and they will move back with you after college. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. All right, so, so uh, let's see what kind of questions folks might have. Who's got the mic? You have the mic, Travis? And, uh, oh, and Mike over here, yeah, Mike has a mic. So, um, over here first. My name is Toshi Nakayama. I teach American politics in Tokyo. Oh, very Kyoto good. University. Great. Uh, this is more of a clarification than a question. Mm -hmm. You had this political correctness and culture wars back in the 90s, right? So what's different this time around? Okay. I guess in the 90s was top down, and this time it's bottom up? That's or is it just a social well, yeah. So good question. Great. In the 1960s, there was a huge wave of student rebellion. Oh, and th that's right. So the 1960s was a big wave, and there was a lot of violence then. I mean, you look at what was happening on campus. Uh, there was the Kent State Massacre. So there was a, it was much more intense in the 60s. Then there was another wave in the late 80s, early 90s. That was actually more faculty driven. That was about diversifying the canon, the reading list. That sort of comes out of the humanities, protests against you know, too many dead white males um, on the syllabus. So, and then there's the new one which started around 2014, 2015. So you're right, there's three waves. This is not new. What is new is the medicalization of it. In other words, in the previous waves, people said, this is unjust, this must change. Nobody said, this is making me sick, this is going to damage my friends, we need protection from that. Nobody said that. That's what's new. And so that's what Greg first noticed, was it's the medicalization, it's the idea that we're fragile, we are so fragile that we need you, the administrators, to protect us. In the 60s, uh, what was different was the students were radical, but first of all, the administration was often actually politically conservative. So it wasn't, the whole campus wasn't on one page politically. So the ideology, there was an ideological conflict on campus. Now there's not much of a conflict on campus. It's all on one side. Um, and then there's the medicalization, and then there's the social media, which allows any little thing can blow up within hours to become a campus-wide disaster. So those are the three big differences that make this situation much, much, well, I shouldn't say worse, because the 60s was, was, there was, again, a lot of violence. But it makes this one different. And it's, it's what makes this one so, it, it's not likely to spread, it has spread. These issues are now out in the workplace, not all industries, but any industry that hires creative talent from the top universities. So journalism, tech, uh, media, the arts, I hear from people in those industries, their, their recent hires are doing this stuff there too. This gentleman over here. Is it on? Okay, All right, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you've looked at uh, parenting for the age group you're describing with uh, for kids who have special needs. I'm just wondering to what degree. We have. Huh. So you're connecting what 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 John's talking about to to. Uh, Kids with special, with special needs. needs, with special needs children. Just yeah, what the effects are for those types of kids. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so Greg, actually I, can say, I asked him if I can say this. Um, Greg, um, Greg Lukianoff, my co-author, has dyslexia. Now that's not exactly, that's not exactly special needs, but what you, what you hear, so many very, very successful people uh, most very successful people had major setbacks, traumas, obstacles in childhood. Um, uh, so depending on how it's handled, those things could be the thing that they overcome, uh, and that's part of the anti-fragility principle. Um, I don't know how special needs kids are treated now. To the, I should, that's a great point, because if our whole point is, since the 90s, we've been massively overprotecting kids. Presumably, we're doing it even more for special needs kids. So it would be fascinating to see whether special needs kids who grew up in the 70s and 80s ended up being much more successful, but those in the 90s are overprotected. I recently came across a concept, the dignity of risk, I think it was called. It comes out of disability scholarship, where when you're in a protective role to a person, say in a wheelchair with a disability, and you make the decision for them about what risks they can take, you're infantilizing them, you're denying them dignity. And so some disability rights activists say, let us make our own choices, let us take some risks. You can't make all the decisions for us. 
I think it's an important concept for child rearing in general. Okay, another dozen minutes here. We'll have uh, the lady here and then the gentleman will be next. Thank you. Uh, you, you, you probably, I'm going to guess, are familiar with, and I'm not going to get his first name at all, but I believe his last name is Louv, L-O-U-V, who wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods, oh, yeah. and about the way that our relationship to the natural world has changed completely because children are not encouraged to go out and play in nature or close to nature, probably not wilderness, yeah. um, and that the consequences of that, it cuts us off from forming profound emotional connections with the world in a way that we badly need if we are going to do something about climate change, among other things. Absolutely, And yes. it seems it dovetails with what you're talking about very nicely. It absolutely does. Um, an interesting thing about the current phenomena that we're writing about is that it's happening in all of the Anglosphere countries. It's not happening on continental Europe. And um, one reason is that the UK did what we did in saying, we've got to get kids learning math earlier and earlier. Whereas in Germany, Switzerland, Scandinavia, they send the kids out. I know they do this in Switzerland, Germany. At four, the kids are one of the thing, main activities is, OK, we're going out into the woods. And they might even have a hatchet or a saw. Let's make a fire you know, with five-year-olds. And it may happen that a kid gets burned. That might happen. And then guess what? They learn. They learn. So there's this great thing on, Staten, on um, Governor's Island in New York called the Junkyard Playground. Um, where I had to sign like huge several page release to let my kids in, but there's hammers and nails and lumber and the kids could get hurt. Um, and I watch and they sometimes do. Like I watched a kid pounding a nail and he hit his thumb and he didn't go running off crying. He just went like this and he picked up the nail again and he kept going. He did it again. And by the third time, he learned how to, how to pound a nail. So um, kids get experience in nature, we, oh, kids always have. Because we got this crazy idea in our heads in the 80s that if a kid is unsupervised, if no adult is watching, that kid will be abducted by a sexual predator. That kid will be, or that kid will be abducted. We got this idea because of cable TV. We freaked out in the 80s. By the 90s, we stopped letting kids out. And the two most dangerous places that we would never let our kids go are public restrooms and the woods. We would never let our kids go to those two places because who knows what will happen to them there. Um, and it's a real shame for exactly the reasons you say. And so this is one of the things I'm hopeful about, that mo you know, so many people re are recognizing, like, nature is good. We have to let kids out in it. And so I think if we can, it's scary to let your kid out alone, but if schools start letting them out, if, if parents get together and make an effort, I think, I think we can reclaim the woods. Just start with you. Do you have any thoughts on uh, uh, what if colleges went to a more open admissions sort of uh, arrangement? What might that do to, for example, high school kids who now are under such pressure, uh, they might be able to you know, enjoy life a little bit more and not have such mm -hmm. pressure when they're in high school. And then when they get to college, maybe you'd have a more diverse, more inclusive, more uh, uh, less inequality. So, yeah, so in America, I think it, we'd never go to a totally open admissions policy. We do, we are committed in some ways to some kinds of meritocracy, but our meritocracy has gotten too much test-based, and that is a problem. We reward people for the kind of intelligence that does well on tests. And then there's a wonderful column by Ivan Krastev, who's actually a fellow here in the New York Times two years ago, about how the, the really twisted thing about our meritocracy is that we reward people for doing well on a test, and then they believe they deserved it because they did well on the test. So there are problems. And there are some interesting proposals to say, above a certain level of, of grades and test scores, above that, we do it randomly. Those would be hard to implement, but those might do some good. I would rather we go another way. The problem you're trying to address is that kids are pressured so much to succeed. Uh, up middle class, upper middle class kids are face so much pressure to succeed, there's no time for play. What we suggest in the book is that we should, we should accept the fact that 18-year-olds should not be on college campuses. 18-year-olds today, as, as Gene Twenge puts it, showing the data, an 18-year-old today is about the same as a 15-year-old from 30 years ago. 18-year-olds, American 18-year-olds are generally, some of them are certainly ready, but a lot of them are just not ready to be on a college campus. And when we bring them to college campuses, they end up, many of them end up requesting infantilizing procedures, which then damages everything else for everyone else. What if the top schools all say, we strongly favor people who have taken a year or two off, had a gap year, 
done military service, lived somewhere else in the country. We think a red-blue switch, like if you're from a blue area, go get a job in a red area, vice versa. Meet people. We've got to get kids away from their parents. Now, boarding school might seem like a way, and I need to do research on this. Boarding school also infantilizes and teaches some bad habits, some of them. I, I don't know enough to comment on all of them. Um, but if college, if Harvard and Yale start saying, we're not going to get the, you know, the person who did 12 extracurriculars in addition to double eight hundreds on the SAT, we're not going for that person anymore. We, we, we're going to favor military veterans, people who went off and did something for a couple of years, and, and we're going to favor people who are 19 or 20 years old. That would be a better way, I think, to take the pressure off kids, um, uh, to, to make parents stop pressuring their kids to achieve, achieve, achieve for your resume. Well, thank you. We're gonna, so we're going to wrap up the conversation there.